All right, well, hello, Anthem. Welcome to the teaching portion of Anthem Online's and Anthem with Friends. Um, so delighted you are here with us. Uh, I'm delighted to be back, actually, with you guys. I hope you really enjoyed the last um, four weeks uh, where you had some amazing teachers, um, both from kind of within our, our Anthem family to our extended family, those here in Ventura, depositing and, and really building you up, encouraging you and pouring into our church. I was blessed and learned a lot. We were watching along the way, and I hope you were as well. Now, remember when we started back in at the beginning of Proverbs in June, we started looking by uh, looking at a few big picture ideas and concepts. And those were just defining what wisdom is. We looked at the gospel in Proverbs. And Steve Ross took us to the blessings of wisdom and the blessings of living a wise life. And then over July, we kind of zoomed in to three case studies. And DJ took us to this case study around words and speech and how to live wisely in the areas of how we talk and how we interact with people. Uh, Terry Fouché, uh, one of my mentors and, and beloved friend of Anthem, took us to how uh, the Proverbs shape our wisdom in family and all relationships, as a matter of fact. And then Brent, just last week, showed us how wisdom informs how we handle our money and our resources and how we steward those things. Now, what we're going to do today and next week is we're going to zoom back out and after we laid some of the groundwork, that foundation, and after we look at those case studies, I want to leave you with a few parting words, some big ideas for continuing to grow in wisdom. And I asked this right at the beginning of this series here. And I asked, do you want wisdom? Is this something you want? Is this something you're going to fight for? Is this something you want to grow in? If so... You will listen to the word of God. You will listen to these, these next couple of weeks as we sort of just look outward and actually look forward in our life and figure out how to apply and grow in wisdom. So the title for today is Cultivating Everyday Character, or it's a double title, How Not to Be a Fool. So pick your poison, whichever one you like best, Cultivating Everyday Character or How Not to Be a Fool. And we're going to be looking at Proverbs chapter 6. So if you have a Bible, open up to Proverbs 6. That's where we're going to be camping out. And Proverbs 6, which if you remember some of your Proverbs background, is still in that beginning part of Proverbs where they're really laying a hermeneutic for wisdom and understanding in those first nine chapters how to even think and process and pursue wisdom. And so those first nine chapters are characterized by, by two primary characters. One is the father to a son, uh, teaching his son about wisdom. And the second is Lady Wisdom calling out. And it's begging us to search her wisdom out no matter what the cost and to not give in to folly or adultery. Now, chapter six is the father's ninth speech to his son. And there's a trove of wisdom gold in here. And as you read through it, maybe you've already read through it with our Proverbs reading plan earlier in July, but as you read through it, you'll see words like snare and caught and hunter and fowler and robber and capture and thief. All these, these characters and these metaphors for someone looking to take something from you. And the young man here in this chapter is warned about what he might lose in bad deals uh, what he might lose in neglect or laziness and, and the wickedness of, of going about scheming to take what's not theirs. And each of these four sections in Proverbs chapter 6 are, are set in the negative. They're talking about these hunters who are going after the simple or the naive, but we can learn wisdom. We can look at the positive side. And so each one of these stories, there is a, a negative side. There's a negative outcome, but it's not inevitable. There's a choice to choose the better and the wise way. Now, they're all interconnected here, but there are four distinct sections. And according to the Father, there are four hunters that are out there looking to ambush your soul and rob it of the good life. And that first story, that first hunter is going to be debt. The first story is about a speculator who becomes trapped in these unwise pledges or commitments or financial dealings. Look at Proverbs chapter 6, verse 1. 
My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, have given your pledge for a stranger, if you are uh, if snared in the words of your mouth, caught in the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, and save yourself. For you have come into the hand of your neighbor. Go, hasten, and plead urgently, urgently with your neighbor. Give your eyes no sleep and your eyelids no slumber. Save yourself like a gazelle from the hand of a hunter, like a bird from the hand of a fowler. Now, what's happening here is the father's warning his son of the dangers of financial liability, even if it's to help out a friend. Stepping into debt is like stepping into a trap. Don't sign your name, he says. And if you do, get yourself out of the situation as soon as possible with dogged persistence to the point of exhaustion and escape like a gazelle or a bird. And these are these two animals who exhibit really fast speeds. Get out of it as soon as possible. Now, strictly speaking, the encouragement and admonition here is not to necessarily avoid such entanglements, although that's implied, but to get out of them as soon as possible. The the command, humble yourself, can also mean go quickly, and the double sense may be intentional here. Now, Now, really, this is less about debt. Although the Proverbs talk about debt a lot and that we should avoid it like the plague, but it's a bit more about integrity. And it's a bit more about getting out of those situations as soon as possible once you know you're in them. And the problem at play here is actually endangering one's own household and livelihood on a bet, on a financial scheme. It's betting something you can't afford to bet. This is the classic, like, dad betting the kid's college fund at the craps table, right? This is exactly what that moment is. And the principle for us to learn to grapple with is that we should remain free of these kind of entanglements, especially those entered in with the idea of of quick and easy gain, these get-rich-quick schemes. But... It's not a prohibition on lending or being um, uh, in financial contract with someone totally because the Bible also tells us it's both wise and good to lend without the expectation of getting anything back. That's Luke chapter 6. Or lending freely without the thought of gain. That's Deuteronomy 15 and it's in the Psalm, Psalm chapter 37. And we remember in the Proverbs themselves, in Proverbs 19, verse 17, it says, He who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward him for what he has done. So we see that teaching in here does not warn against loans and gifts to those in need, but the warning here is against shaky business ventures and get-rich schemes that cost you or can cost you everything. The principle here is avoiding bad commitments that will lead us Um, into ruin. And the principle here of avoiding these bad commitments lead us to take stock of how we have portioned our time and prioritized our time, our money and our other resources. Don't limit this to just money. Think of those moments in life where you have given away the only unrenewable resource you have that is time for the sake of something that's not worth it. The lesson to be learned here is to avoid those responsibilities that are not ours so we can be free for those that are ours. Which brings us here to the second hunter, starting in verse 6. And that second hunter for your soul to rob it of the good life is laziness. The second story is all about the sluggard who becomes prey to poverty. Verse 6, go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Now here the father tells the son that poverty will come upon him like a robber if he doesn't learn to work hard. Check out the ants, he says, pointing to the the diligent way these insects store provisions for their future. 
And this vignette here speaks not only to the hard work and diligence needed for a successful life, but initiative. Don't wait for someone else to spell it out for you. Don't wait for someone to hold your hand through the whole process or for work that you should be doing on your own. Now, we've all been that person and we've all worked with that person, right? Have you ever had to work on a group project at work or in school? Or There's always someone who doesn't take the initiative, who's not doing the hard work, who's not diligent, and there's always someone who's having to pick up their slack. Now, we've all been both people, I think, most times. But this teaching also shows us that laziness is, at its root, a failure of love. While others provide for their self and their family, caring for others, the lazy person wants to be carried along. It's just selfishness. And the irony of our contemporary life is that we are lazy about a great number of things in the midst of frantic activity and hurriedness. For us, good commitments might include rest and worship on Sabbath, like unhurried time with family and friends to build strong relationships, and schedules planned far enough in advance to ensure that what we do, we do well. How ironic is it that we are busier than ever, and I believe actually lazier than ever, not willing to put in the hard work. Too often I find I I will take on too much, and I end up doing a half-baked job across the board, and I not only suffer, but the people I interact with suffer as well. We know when we have made bad choices, when other people have to suffer loss because we've chosen poorly. We've been lazy, we haven't been diligent, and we haven't taken the initiative. And then we come to the third story, and the third hunter, that is pride. And the third story is the scoundrel, I love that word, the scoundrel who stirs up dissension and is destroyed. Verse 12, a worthless person, a wicked man, goes about with crooked speech, winks with his eye, signals with his feet, points with his finger, with a perverted heart devises evil, continually sowing discord. Therefore, calamity will come upon him suddenly. In a moment, he will be broken beyond healing. Now, in these verses, the topic switches from the sluggard to the slanderer or the scoundrel. Both are deemed worthless people by the father. But the latter receives the father's harshest criticism. What's clear here is that whatever this person is up to, the father is making it clear to the son that this is premeditated evil doing. This is scheming. This is devising. Right? These are outward expressions of internal plotting and deceit. And then what we have right after in this next paragraph is a kind of a catalog of a list of things that, quote, the Lord hates, right? And it's paired up right with this prideful person who's scheming, this scoundrel who's devising evil things in their heart, right? This is not accidentally falling into a trap anymore. This is not naivete. This is like intentional plotting of bad things. And right up, nestled up against that, is this catalog of list of things the Lord hates, culminating with someone who creates relational disharmony. Look at verse 16. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. That's kind of a a poetic uh, phrase used all throughout the Proverbs and the Bible, actually, in other books. Six things the Lord hates and seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who swords discord among brothers. What we see here with these two paragraphs together is that we're called, as followers of Jesus, those who love God, to hate the things God hates. That list 16, 17, 18, and 19, those verses, those are things that not only God hates, but you should hate too. We're called to love the things God loves and hate the things God hates. This is not only a huge challenge for us not to be like this person, but to learn to be actually like disgusted with these things in ourselves and and, and even in other people, to be like repulsed by these things. 
by, or repulsed by a heart that devises wicked plans, hands that shed innocent blood, false witness who breathes out lies, one who sows discord among brothers and sisters. These should be like off-putting to us. And these kind of what seem like miscellaneous instructions throughout this chapter are more than just practical advice, although they are that. They're more about practical advice about loans and laziness and your speech. They offer theological insight into God's desires for a just and harmonious life together. We're getting a snapshot of the life God intends for us by looking at a picture of the life he detests and he hates. Which brings us to our fourth story. The fourth hunter is lust. The fourth and final story is don't give in to lust. As you read through the Proverbs, you'll see a lot of the Proverbs are about lust and adultery. Now, it's widely believed adultery throughout Proverbs has this double meaning. It is both a call to literal sexual purity and and righteousness. um, And it's also figuratively a call not to give in to the seduction of folly or the way of the world, but to remain pure and faithful to God himself. So this last section, I'll read the whole thing and just make a few comments on it. Starts in verse 20. My son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk with you. For the commandment is a lamp Uh, and the teaching a light and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life to preserve you from the evil woman from the smooth tongue of the adulteress do not desire her beauty in your heart and do not let her capture you capture you with her eyelashes for the prince of a prostitute is only a loaf of bread the price of a prostitute is only a loaf of bread but a married woman hunts down a precious life Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes and not be burned? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So he is who goes into his neighbor's wife. None who touches her will go unpunished. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his appetite when he's hungry. But if he is caught, he will pay sevenfold. He will give all the goods of his house. He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. He will get wounds and dishonor and his disgrace will not be wiped away. For jealousy makes a man furious and he will not spare when he takes revenge. He will accept no compensation. He will refuse you through, through you multiply gifts. Now the last warning here takes the form of his speech. Once again, we encounter the adulteress or the evil woman. This woman will hunt you down, the father says, and and capture her prey with her eyelashes. She'll seduce you with her her beauty and these external things. Don't be fooled. There will only be pain from engaging with her. Remember, this is both literal adultery, lust, and figurative, like being unfaithful to God. And the father asks this rhetorical question, can a man walk on hot coals and not get his feet burned? No, it is inevitable you will be burned by this way of life. And by juxtaposing these vignettes of unwise pledges and short-sighted laziness earlier in the chapter with the seductions of extramarital relations, it shows that adultery is both naive and evil. Like the traps and ambushes of laziness, it will catch one unaware. It'll sneak up like you. And like the schemes of wickedness and falsehood, adultery steals and lies and stirs up dissension and causes problems. And moreover, common to all the warnings that are throughout Proverbs chapter 6 are the payments exacted or the price to pay the consequences of foolish choices. The theme of unnecessary loss continues. In each case, the teacher points out the irony that we've observed throughout the instructions. Those who take from others end up having others take from them. 
Now, the uniting theme throughout this entire chapter is the father's encouragement to maintain a healthy distance from these sly hunters, to not even go near them, but to stay far, far away. To give in to them is to forsake freedom and give way to death and calamity. Now, standing at the crossroads of this choice, the teachers of Proverbs point to the way of diligence and righteousness as an alternative route. And the picture we get from the New Testament is one of constant and continual change and transformation to be more like Jesus, but it's not inevitable. The the invitation is open, but it's not decided for you. You have to choose wisdom or foolishness, transformation or regression. The invitation is open. And in the language of Paul, to put on the new self, the wise self, The new person made in the image of Jesus becoming like Jesus. And that word, we've talked about this before, put on is enduyo in the Greek. And it means to sink into or to put on clothing. It's this image of getting up every day and and slipping into your pants or putting on your shirt. It's this daily action of putting on the things of Christ and putting on the things of wisdom. Now put off the old self, the, the sluggard, the slanderer, the scoundrel. The prideful, the naive, the fool, put off those things and pursue wisdom. Put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Cultivating everyday character is all about not becoming a fool, not giving in to these sly hunters that will come after you of debt, of laziness, of pride, of adultery. We can avoid those by putting on the life and character of Christ. Now, Paul writes to many different churches to put on Christ. To the Romans, he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. To the Galatians, he says, for as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. And to the Ephesians, he says, put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. And to the Colossians, he says, don't lie to one another. You've put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed. And because wisdom comes from God, it affects our character, the very nature of who we are. And if we're being formed and shaped by God's way, we'll be formed and shaped by God's ways wisdom. According to Paul, these things don't just happen to us. We have to put them on. And according to the book of Proverbs, this is a choice, an invitation to choose wisdom or folly, to choose to run after lady wisdom who is calling or give in to the evil adulteress. Now, we've talked about formation before, how we're unintentionally formed just by waking up in the morning, by the culture around us, by the world, by our own selfish desires. And the way of Jesus promises nothing short of full-on transformation, but that transformation takes participation and intentionality. And the early church father, Augustine, once wrote, without God, we can't, and without us, he won't. We participate with God in this transformation, in this life of choosing wisdom. And that kind of intentional formation looks like teaching what I'm doing right now, practice, actually making different decisions in life. Community, sharing our our wins and struggles with others and asking them to help us keep us accountable. And and it's fueled by the Holy Spirit. We've been given the deposit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it happens over time through many trials. And the picture given in the New Testament is the gospel application of, of a wise life in Proverbs. Jesus paved the way for us to cultivate the character of God in our own person and our own personality through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Proverbs provide an insight into what that character looks like lived out, or how to not be a fool. Now, is transformation possible? Is is choosing wisdom possible? Is becoming like Jesus possible? Yes, absolutely, but it is not inevitable. Two choices, wisdom, folly. 
pride, humility, laziness, diligence, debt, integrity, adultery, purity. These are all binary choices. Will you choose the life God has for you? Put on the new self, put on the way of wisdom, or will you give in to the easy way? Transformation, becoming like Jesus, becoming wise is not only possible, but it's expected and promised. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. As followers of Jesus, we have been predestined to become like Jesus, to be wise. Will we embrace it or resist it? It's possible, it's promised, it's expected, but it's not inevitable. The life Jesus invites us into isn't saying yes to Jesus just for heaven and no to him for the rest of our lives here on earth. It's a life of constantly growing, being filled, maturing, becoming like Jesus, becoming more wise. It's a life beholding the glory of God himself and being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another over time. It's a life of not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewal of our mind into the likeness and image of Jesus himself. Our predestined purpose is to become like Jesus, wise in its fully matured form, Jesus. That process, though, takes participation and intentionality, and it requires you to make a choice. Do you want wisdom? As you, as you look at the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of your life, who are you becoming? Are, are the choices that you're making right now teeing you up to become more wise, to become more like Jesus? Or are you just falling into the same traps you've fallen into before? When you look at the trajectory of your life, who are you becoming? Now I'll ask, as you look at the trajectory of your life, who do you want to become? Because the choices you make right now in your life shape who you're becoming. You can't put off wisdom down the road. You can't put off being like Jesus for down the road. These are choices you make today. Debt or integrity, laziness or diligence, pride or humility, adultery, or purity. Who will you be? Who are you choosing to become? Because whatever choices you are making today, 100% shape who, are you, who you're becoming. Your life today matters. Your decisions today matters. In the words of Jesus, let those who have ears hear. I'm going to lead you through two prayers right now. And the first is a prayer of intention, and the second is a prayer of formation. So, Lord, I desire to be more like you. It's intention. Help me to grow to become more like you by living wisely. The second prayer is, Lord, I want to desire to be more like you. It's formation. Help me change my desires from foolishness to wisdom. Pray with me. Jesus, we recognize that all good things come from you, including wisdom. And we recognize the only path to true wisdom is, is the path of following you and becoming more like you. And so, Lord, I pray for myself and for anybody watching, anyone gathering together for this teaching. Lord, we, we desire to be like you, to become wise. Please help us live wisely. Would you elevate the voice of your Holy Spirit to shape decisions in our lives now that help us become like you over the course of our life. And we pray a prayer formation. Lord, I want to desire to be like you. Change our, our motives, change our desires, change our loves 
to actually pursue you and the things of your kingdom, not all the other things that try to fool us into believing they'll ultimately satisfy us, but won't. We want to desire to be like you. Would you create, curate, craft in us a desire to be wise like you? And pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.